It's a pleasure to be here in Heartland. This is my first time to visit, and the campus is beautiful. They tell me it's even prettier in the spring and fall and summer. They also tell me in the summer it's a, it might be more pretty, but it's also more humid. Uh, but it's, it's very, very nice. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to get better acquainted with your students. We've appreciated Heartland over the years and the uh, students that have uh, enriched the Lord's work throughout the world from this institution. Um, Tonight I want to give you a quick overview of what we'll be talking about because I want it to be very practical and helpful in our daily lives. So you will know where we're going. Um, here's an outline of the study tonight. We'll begin with some common clinical examples. We'll do a case study involving a friend of mine. And uh, then we'll have a brief overview of the neurosciences of, on how the frontal lobe is involved with how we uh, become who we are. And then we'll turn to the inspired sources Christians have been provided to gain profound and important insights showing how this, this information is life and death. Jeremiah 21, 8, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I have set before you the way of life, and the way of death. Let's just bow our heads for an additional word of prayer. Our dear Lord, bless us as we uh, study the book of nature, the book of life experiences, and then open up the book of Scripture and see how profoundly it helps us understand ourselves. I pray that Tonight will be different because you've spoken to us. And may it not simply be words to our minds, but may it be encouragement and life change to our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Physicians are interested in diagnosis. We listen to patients' complaints and then we ask focused questions. Finally, we perform a physical examination and where necessary do uh, appropriate diagnostic, radiographic, lab tests, all to confirm our impression of what a patient may have. But just as there are diseases of the body, there are diseases of the soul. Pretend you're a doctor here and try to imagine, uh, take your hand at spiritual diagnosis this evening. What would your diagnosis be to a church member who presented with the following signs and symptoms? First sign, failure to recognize the real value of spiritual activities. For example, he'd go to prayer meeting, but would consider that drudgery and would prefer not to and may not go. At the same time, the member shows attention and interest in secular topics and meetings and, and would have no problem staying at home from prayer meeting and watching television. A second sign, a church member is able to get to work on time daily, but can't make it on time to Sabbath school. Notice the third sign, the member has time for news, internet, and hobbies, but little time for Bible study and prayer. And the fourth sign you observe is that the member's evangelistic fervor, zeal, and enthusiasm for present truth seems to be waning. While the member may have lively discussions on sports and Topics of the day with politics, the member doesn't have much to say about the Bible or eternal life to his co-workers, fellow students, families, or friends. And the fifth sign you note, the member has unwanted feelings of guilt when reading portions of the spirit of prophecy, listening to convicting sermons, or in the presence of spirit-filled Christians. The fifth sign you note, however, is associated with a temporary false peace that people get whenever they give a give up the battle against self. Peace has come because they are now getting their way. You can see that in volume 5, page 41. 54, I should say. This is the false security of Laodicea. And they may say they're rich, become wealthy, have need of nothing, 
And do not recognize that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, another sign, frequent disagreements and arguments with the um, member's spouse or with family members. The home is not a peaceful place. There's strife and contention. The member complains and criticizes and has few expressions of praise and gratitude and thankfulness. And the member is often impatient with the spouse and family members. Unkind, rude, and cutting comments are made to others or of others. Immoral desires increase and there is a bondage to addictions. There are attempts to hide these addictions and, it, and, emer, and then emerges a double life of deception and hypocrisy. Fits of anger occur and loss of temper. There's independence of action and a rejection of authority. Can you recognize and diagnose the following two common signs in a parishioner? Do you know the most common cause of this disorder? And do you know how to administer the only known curative treatment for this otherwise fatal disorder? Recently, a close friend of mine developed apparently minor changes in behavior. For example, the individual had been a pattern of dependability, but began to forget some appointments. Other changes occurred, but their importance was not recognized until one day the symptoms suddenly worsened and became so severe that my friend was rushed to the emergency room. An MRI was ordered and a malignant tumor was found in the frontal lobe explaining the behavioral changes. Huge malignant tumor. Frontal lobe deficits from disease, surgery, medications, or injury vary. They can be very subtle or they can be profound. They can become so severe as to completely change the personality. Probably most of us are familiar with the widely publicized and classic story of Phineas Gage, who had the injury to his frontal lobe pictured above. It will change his, it changed his behavior and his personality completely. Since it's so well known, I'm not going to repeat it today, but there is an interesting component to the story that is less known. Dr. John Harlow was the physician who followed Phineas Gage. And he published his findings in 1848 in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, now known as the New England Medical Journal. He had a subsequent follow-up study, but Dr. Harlow's focus was not on the injury, but was on the fact that this patient had survived. He did note personality changes in his final report in 1868, but it was just in passing. It took another two decades before Dr. Welt and then three years later, Dr. Oppenheimer connected the frontal lobe injury with personality changes. Many other studies have since been published in the medical literature connecting the frontal lobe to our thoughts and our actions. One I found very interesting was a study by Hugh Jarvie, a physician in Liverpool, England. The study was published in a British medical journal following World War II. Let me give you a little background for this study. When soldiers were inducted into the army prior to World War II, they were given special tests that included psychological and personality tests. Of course, many soldiers had frontal lobe injuries from gunshot wounds during the war. And after their maximal recovery, they were retested, and the results compared to their pre-injury results on those psychological testing. And the research indicated that certain permanent changes in behavior took place only when the frontal lobe was injured. Jarvie found that certain patterns of reaction were markedly present with frontal lobe injuries in only a minority of cases, however. One very interesting conclusion was that while many individuals did not have profound and striking changes that you see in a full frontal lobe syndrome, there were many others with subtle personality changes from frontal lobe damage. These more subtle changes are the focus of our study together tonight. Let me just briefly review the fact that the frontal lobe is a key distinguishing 
human feature, vastly separating man from animals. That's why an injury uh, involving the frontal lobe is so serious. On the screen, you can see the frontal lobe of the lion, the hyena, and the kodimundi, which is a member of the raccoon family. When the spirit of prophecy speaks of the animal or lower nature, or Paul speaks of the carnal nature, the flesh, they're referring to this, the much less executive area of the brain. As you might guess, there is much less difference between the animals and man in this back part of the brain. Look at the forehead. Do you think this is the skull of a human or an ape? If you guessed ape, you would be right. Since the forehead encases and protects the frontal lobe, you can infer from the scalp forehead the relative size of the frontal lobe. We instinctively know this, and this was recognized from ancient times. The ancient Chinese sculptures of their gods typically had a very broad, high forehead. How do evolutionary artists attempt to portray early, what they consider precursors to humans? Notice this exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. These are supposed to be evolutionary ancestors to humans, but they're just a figment of an artist's imagination. What is this artist portraying by the slanted, receding forehead? The artist was attempting to portray that animals have less frontal lobe than humans, and he is imagining what supposed missing links pre-humans might look like. But moving from the make-believe to the real, what do you think Jesus' forehead looked like? Notice inspiration's description of Jesus' forehead at the time of Christ's trial before Pilate. Um, his forehead was described as, read it with me, broad and high. Jesus had a good frontal lobe. The Bible tells us that mankind was created a little lower than the angels. Since the frontal lobe separates humans from animals, what part of the brain do you think separates man from angels? You might surmise that they have a larger frontal lobe. I believe that this may be true. Notice what it is said about angels. Uh, speaking of the uh, covering cherub, his forehead was what? High and broad, showing a powerful intellect. And again, um, another statement, his forehead was high and broad, showing great intelligence. Paul quotes Psalm 8.5 that we just read in Hebrews 2.7, but Paul quotes from the Septuagint, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. So we were a little while lower than the angels. Humans will not always be a little lower than the angels. They will be equal to the angels. Jesus says those who are counted worthy to attain the resurrection from the dead are, what does it say? Equal to the angels being sons of the resurrection, Luke 25 and 6. So heaven, you see, will not only bring us new bodies, but thank the Lord, it will bring us new minds with significantly enhanced frontal lobes. Grace elevates us. Right doing exalts us. No notice how sin degrades us into brute beasts by attacking our frontal lobe. Sin makes us animals. Jude 10, whatever they know naturally like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. The story of David and Goliath reveals that when you get the forehead, you get the man. In prophecy, the forehead represents the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is where the battlefield for control of the mind takes place. The word of God is like the stone that David launched from his sling that kills the giants that control or try to control our lives. There's an interesting letter Ellen White wrote during her time in Australia. It was about a former alcoholic. Letter 48, 1899. His family looked upon Brother Hungerford as one who would not amount to much. Now notice what a prophet noticed about this man that the family failed to see. She said his forehead is large and broad. He wasn't some prehistoric human. 
He was a man. He had a frontal lobe where the family saw no hope. Jesus saw infinite possibilities because as humans, we have a frontal lobe. And I could not see why a man, she continues, with such a head should be unable to support himself. We supplied the family with clothing and food, but this part of the program, uh, this uh, part helping the family, was now over. That large head, she concludes, we believe will be of some account yet. You see, this man's natively gifted frontal lobe had been attacked by sin until his family saw no potential at all in him. He was a drunkard, and it seemed that he must be forever in bondage to liquor. But grace had provided a way of deliverance. In a manuscript Ellen White wrote, manuscript 137, 1899, Brother Hungerford had a large, and a, a large head and a broad, well-shaped forehead, and had he always let l liquor alone, he might have advanced in knowledge. Where did the alcohol attack? the frontal lobe. But something changed. Notice the next sentence. He began to keep the Sabbath. And when he began to keep the Sabbath, other things begin to change. Please don't miss the whole sentence. When he began to keep the Sabbath, he gave up everything like intemperance. When did victory begin in Brother Hungerford's life? When he began to keep the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath is not a small thing. The Sabbath is not something we can take or leave. This is life-changing. That is why God gave us the Sabbath. And when we spend an uninterrupted day every week with Jesus, he changes us. And what happened when he started keeping the Sabbath? He gave up everything like intemperance. Problems that had bound him for years began to fall away. What was happening to his frontal lobe? It was healing. The seal of God was being placed in his forehead. What is the seal of God? It is the Sabbath. Where is it placed? On the forehead. What does it represent, the forehead? The frontal lobe. These are not simply abstract biblical ideas. These are changing us at the very cellular level. They change our minds. They change our brains. He was thoroughly converted and said that he hardly knew himself. So different was he from what he used to be. You see, when the frontal lobe is changed, we're changed. The bad news is that when we sin, the frontal lobe is changed and we are changed. The good news is that when we respond to the gospel, God begins to restore the frontal lobe and we are changed. We're new creatures. Keeping the Sabbath changes us for it places the seal of God on our forehead. It takes more than a daily short period of devotions. It takes more than an hour of church every Sunday to change us. Even an hour of church every Sabbath. We need a full day each week of uninterrupted time with Jesus to restore our manhood or our womanhood, our humanhood, the grace of God that appears to all men, gives us the power to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and enables us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Titus 2.12. Let's look again at the frontal lobe. This is where the executive functions of the brain occur. The executive functions are such things as motivation, planning, and social behavior. They are also the seat of judgment and the home of the will. It is the frontal lobe that gives us our interest in spiritual activities. The frontal lobe has to do with the conscience, the ability to differentiate right from wrong, selflessness, recognition and appreciation of goodness, the desire to do right, a hatred of evil. All these things happen in the frontal lobe. And when we damage our frontal lobe, these executive 
executive abilities and functions of the brain are lessened. God designed the helmet of salvation to protect our foreheads from the assaults of Satan. The earliest studies of the frontal lobe were limited and failed to take into account the importance of the rest of the brain in these functions. Today, however, leading neuroscientists acknowledge that there is a wider brain involvement in frontal lobe problems and what yesterday was called frontal lobe syndrome today is more often called disexecutive syndrome. Here's an atrophied frontal lobe. This is from a disease called frontal lobe degeneration. In this case, it was a 61-year-old former dentist. During the evaluation, he made a number of inappropriate comments to female personnel. His wife stated, he says things he never would have before. I guess his personality just changed, and you should see how he goes for sweets now. Diet changed. Appropriate act, uh, wording changed. As a dermatologist, I have found electrodermal activity studies to be quite interesting. The skin's ability to conduct electricity can be measured, and it is changed by such things as the amount of sweat on our, uh, the surface of our skin. So researchers look at this electrical dermal activity. Dr. Theodore Zahn and a team at Northwestern University, Department of Physical Medicine, found that those with certain types of frontal lobe damage did not have a normal response to words or pictures compared to those without a frontal lobe lesion. Their frontal lobe lesions and injuries had changed their evaluation of the world around them. The frontal lobe is responsible for problem-solving motor function, memory, judgment, impulse control, and social behavior. It is also needed for, uh, for goal-directed behavior, and frontal lobe problems show up with indifference to spiritual things, disinhibitions, <clears throat> absence of concern for the future, argumentative and opinionated, impatient, demanding, unkind, anxiety and depression, anger, dishonesty, and sexual focus. Let's review a familiar quotation. I was then showing Satan as he was, there in heaven, a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown as he now is, him as he now is. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. That brow, which was once so noble, I particularly noticed. Right up here. His forehead commenced from his eyes to do what? Recede backwards. Why? I saw that he had demeaned himself so long that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. His eyes were cunning, sly, and showed great penetration. His frame was large, but the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. Loyal angels look like they did 6,000 years ago. Perhaps they look even better. But we see that evil angels have aged. They've developed wrinkles. They have lost that useful look. This is what sin does to one being over time. But now I want you to notice what sin does to a race of beings over generations. In vision, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 52, Adam was carried down through successive generations and saw the increase of crime, of guilt and defilement because man would yield, man would yield to his naturally strong inclinations to transgress the holy law of God. He was shown the curse of God resting more and more heavily upon the human race, upon the cattle, and upon the earth because of man's continued transgression. He was shown that iniquity and violence would steadily increase. Yet, amid all the 
tide of human misery and woe, there would ever be a few who would preserve the knowledge of God and would remain unsullied amid the prevailing moral degeneracy. Adam was made to comprehend what sin is, the transgression of the law. He was shown that moral, mental, and physical degeneracy would result to the race from transgression until the world would be filled with human misery of every type. The days of man were shortened by his own course of sin in transgressing the righteous law of God. The race was finally so greatly depreciated that they appeared, what does it say? Inferior, and I'm glad for the next word, almost valueless. Almost. They were generally incompetent to appreciate the mystery of Calvary, the grand and elevated facts of the atonement and the plan of salvation, because of the indulgence of the carnal mind. What do you need the frontal lobe to understand this? What do you need in the mind so that you can understand the atonement, the plan of salvation, and the mystery of Calvary? You need a frontal lobe, a functioning frontal lobe. Yet, notwithstanding the weakness and enfeebled mental, moral, and physical powers of the human race, Christ, true to the purpose for which he left heaven, continues his interest in the feeble, depreciated, degenerate specimens of humanity and invites them to hide their weakness and great deficiencies in him. If they will come unto him, he will supply all their needs. Here's another interesting quotation on Satan's plan of attack. This is from Manuscript 1897, Manuscript 3. Satan's ear caught the words spoken by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he determined to unite all the power of his army and of human beings with himself to accomplish the ruin of the race. Now how was he going to do this? He would commence with the appetite. He would bring his temptations to bear upon this point and by a perverted appetite destroy the mental and physical force and make men appear a revolting, polluted being before his maker. And Satan has carried out his purpose. Researchers from the University of North Carolina Gilling School of Global Health Public health have found that 88% of the United States adult population is metabolically unhealthy. 88%. 88% of adults here in the U.S. have one or more abnormalities in the following indicators. Number one, blood glucose. Number two, triglycerides. Number three, high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. Number four, blood pressure. And number five, waist circumference. If adults can maintain optimal levels of these indicators without medication, they are deemed metabolically healthy. Abnormalities in these metabolic health indicators are principally diet related, although genetics, accidents, and disease can be the cause of some. But what does this information mean? It means that a vast proportion of the adult population in our country is at great risk for developing diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and other dangerous health conditions. That means pain, disability, financial stress, premature aging, and early death. But there's something far more serious, self-inflicted, disexecutive syndrome. Uh, Councils on Health 577. Eating has much to do with, with religion. Eating has much to do with what? With religion. Has to do with how we worship. The spiritual experience is, what is the next word? Greatly affected by the way in which the stomach is treated. Greatly affected. Eating and drinking in accordance with the laws of health promote virtuous actions. But if the stomach is abused by habits that have no foundation in nature, 
Satan takes advantage of the wrong that has been done and uses the stomach as an enemy of righteousness. So, Satan, the enemy of righteousness, wants to use our stomachs in his battle against us and our frontal lobes, creating a disturbance which affects the entire being. What are the results? The quotation continues. Sacred things are not appreciated. Spiritual zeal diminishes. Peace of mind is lost. There is dissension, strife, and discord. Impatient words are spoken, and unkind deeds are done, but it gets worse. Dishonest practices are followed, the, and anger is manifested, and all because the nerves of the brain are disturbed by the abuse heaped upon the stomach. With this background, let's relook at the clinic case we saw at the start of our study. The member finds that church activities and meetings are less interesting than secular topics and meetings. Though the member can always be on time at work at 8 a.m., the member finds it hard to arrive at Sabbath school at 9.30 or maybe even at church at 11 a.m. The member has time for internet news, hobbies, sports, but little time for daily Bible study and prayer. Though the member easily thinks and speaks of sports, politics, or other secular topics to others, the member seldom thinks or speaks of God in home or work. The member finds that reading the spirit of prophecy brings feelings of guilt. The member experiences anxiety and may have periods of depression. The member has Frequent complaints is critical and unthankful. There's dissension in the home and frequent arguments. The member is impatient with spouse and family and makes unkind and cutting remarks. The member experiences immoral desires, thoughts, and practices and is in bondage to addictions, which the member attempts to hide and is deceptive about. The member's church attendance and church activities are hypocritical attempts to hide the pollution of the soul. There's anger um, as a problem and rejection of authority. This is mild disexecutive syndrome. These are symptoms of a malfunctioning frontal lobe. This is compatible with this disexecutive syndrome and it's common, brothers and sisters, in the church. Councils on Health, page 575. Those who indulge in meat eating tea drinking, and gluttony are sowing seeds for a harvest of pain and death. The unhealthful food placed in the stomach strengthens the appetites that war against the soul, developing the lower propensities. These habits are attacking the frontal lobe. This is very important, and, and, and we mustn't be distracted. A diet of flesh meat tends to develop animalism. This is another way of saying this diet is weakening the frontal lobes. That's what it's saying. A development of animalism lessens spirituality, rendering the mind incapable of understanding truth. The Bible points to the diet of the Jews as a major reason they rejected Jesus. Their table became a snare and a trap. They stumbled over the denial of their appetite. This made them incapable of seeing and recognizing truth that the careful, abstemious diet of John could see readily. Their frontal lobes were not functioning properly, and they were unable to recognize and appreciate the Messiah when he walked among them. Notice the words of Paul. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for, for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. The issue is serious. The salvation of our souls is at stake. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. Just as Daniel's diet determined his faithfulness, our diet can now determine our future faithfulness. It's a part of being prepared 
for the crisis. The delicate organs of digestion should be respected. This is a part of the first angel's message, which calls for us to give glory to our creator by not defiling his creation and what, when, and how we eat. God cannot enlighten the mind of a man who makes a cesspool of his stomach. When we regard iniquity in our hearts by cherishing the sin of a depraved appetite, when we wantonly hazard our own life by the way we eat, he cannot hear our prayers. He does not hear the prayers of those who are walking in the light of the sparks of their own kindling. As a general rule, rule we place too much food in the stomach. How can we tell? Many make themselves uncomfortable by overeating and sickness is often the result. Many eat too rapidly. Others eat at one meal varieties of food that do not agree. If men and women would only remember how greatly they afflict the soul when they afflict the stomach and how deeply Christ is dishonored when the stomach is abused, they would deny the appetites and thus give the stomach opportunity to recover its healthy action. While sitting at the table, we may do medical missionary work by eating and drinking to the glory of God. Isn't that wonderful? Every Seventh-day Adventist can do medical missionary work simply by the way they eat at the table. So let's return to the diagnostic challenge at the beginning of our study. How do we treat this fatal disorder? The problem cannot be cured by mere health education because the executive functions of the brain are unable to understand, plan, and execute. Why? The diet. What can we do? Careful attention should be given to those who are enslaved by evil habits. We must lead them to the cross of Christ. It was only by the most desperate conflict with the powers of Satan that Christ could accomplish his purpose of restoring the almost obliterated image of God in man and place his own signature upon his forehead. It was a desperate battle, for Satan had so long worked in league with human intelligences as to almost completely intercept every ray of light shining from the throne of God upon the human mind. The cross of Calvary alone could destroy the works of the devil. In that wondrous sacrifice, all eyes were called to behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The love of Christ kindles in the heart of all who continue to behold him. There has been a continual backsliding in health reform. And as a result, God is dishonored by a great lack of spirituality. You see, these things are spiritual issues. And God calls upon every church member to dedicate his life unreservedly to the Lord's service. He calls for decided reformation. All creation is groaning under the curse. God's people should place themselves where they will grow in grace, being sanctified body, soul, and spirit by the truth. And when they break away from all health-destroying indulgences, they will have a clear perception of what constitutes true godliness. A wonderful change will be seen in the religious experience. In the section that I've read, I found as a result of preparing for this time together, it's time to wake out of sleep. And so I went through the spirit of prophecy, seeking quotations to find about waking up. And what I have just shared with you is a summary of this quote. And it closes, it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, 
But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Well, that's what I want to do. I want to do this weekend. I want to make decisions to wake up from sleep, to allow God to restore my frontal lobe. I want to understand the message of the cross. I want to understand the truths of the atonement. I want to understand Jesus so I can be like him. I know that's your desire too. If that's your desire, would you just stand with me and let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to wake out of sleep. We want to be alert so that we can help others be alert. Our frontal lobes are damaged and Satan wants to destroy them. But we want that seal of God, the restored frontal lobe. What really makes us human. And we pray that we will not allow um, entry of sin through our mouth that will harm our heads. We will not allow entry of sin through our eyes that could harm our head. We will not allow entry of sin through our ears that can harm our head. And Lord, you're going to have to take away the thoughts and memories that are already inside. So through the power of Jesus, through the wonders of the restorative Sabbath that we've now entered in, we can have the peace of heaven, the joy of righteousness. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.